You know, today is supposed to be part B of our fourth F word. Um, our F words this month, for those of you who don't know, we're in the series called Intentional. And what we've done is each week we've looked at a different F word. Um, the first one we looked at was our future, talking about our time, being intentional with our time and how we want to live our lives. Next thing we talked about was being intentional with our friends. Who are the people that we allow to influence us? And it's interesting because since that message, I've had a few different discussions with people, um, surprisingly, with people like my age, talking about the, their friends and the people that they let influence their lives. And I talked about it a little bit on that, that weekend service. Oftentimes when we think of our friends, we, th we think of our young people. I see Chris and, and Kimmy back there, young people, people in their early 20s. And, and we talk as parents especially about the influence that other people have at that age. But oftentimes we dismiss ourselves and we forget the people that we allow to influence us and, and the people that we let treat us bad. Why do we do that? Because we're afraid of what we're going to do if we don't have 100 friends. And you guys, I want to encourage you with that. Be intentional with the people that you allow to speak into your life. The people that you allow to paint on the canvas of your life, be intentional with those people. If people treat you poorly, if people talk behind your back, if you, if you can't confide in them, yet you call them your closest friends, change something. Make a decision to not continue to do that. If, if you hang out with people who are going to bring you in the wrong direction, who are not going to encourage you to foster a healthy, growing relationship with Jesus, change your friends. Change them. And I know as I say that, it's scary, but I'm going to tell you something. Life with Jesus, it can be scary. That's another word we could do. Life with Jesus, it's not easy. Life with Jesus comes with great sacrifice. That's reality. But if we want to be successful in living this life with Jesus... Sometimes we have to make extremely difficult decisions. Don't let people paint on your canvas that aren't on the same page with you. The Bible talks about being equally yoked. Be equally yoked with your spouse. Young people, be equally yoked with the person that you want to marry. But I look at that and I think the same as should be should be uh, fitting with our, our close friends. If your best friend is a non-believer and you're a believer who is fired up hot after Jesus, I bet you that this happens sometimes. And when you go to them looking for advice, I'm going to guess they don't quote Scripture. And that's a very challenging thought. <coughs> very challenging thought. But if we claim to live our lives based on the truth that is in this book, and our faith is the number one thing, most important aspect of it, ought not our closest inner circle be fellow believers? Something to ponder. That was the, the second thing. The third thing we talked about, the third F word, was our faith. Be intentional with our faith. Coming back to the basics of living out our faith. If you remember, if you were here that weekend, I had footballs and stuff up here, and I talked about a quarterback, an all-star quarterback. If you go watch that quarterback practice, they're going to be practicing the basics of their sport, the basics of their craft. They're going to be throwing the ball. They're going to be receiving the ball from the, from the center. This is what they're going to be doing over and over again. They're going to practice handing the ball off. They practice and master the basics of their craft and find themselves with extreme success. As Christians, I, I tried to challenge us to be intentional with our faith, to do the exact same thing, to come back to the basics and be intentional with our faith. Practicing passing, if you will by reading our devotions, getting into the Word, having a solid prayer life, worshiping, engaging in worship. When we sing a song like, I still believe, 
And I, and I can tell I'm, I'm, in, I'm a little bit, I must have got some good sleep last night. Because I want to challenge you a little bit. Do you believe in God? Because my vantage point would say about 10 people do. Do you love him? With, with, with your whole heart, do you love him? And does anybody around you know that? Heck, does God know that? I want to challenge you with that thought. That's being a Christian. Get uncomfortable a little bit. Worship the God of the universe. Worship your Savior. This guy who died on a cross for you. Worship him. He's your Lord and your Master. You know, you watch some of these olden time shows, and, and when the king walks in, the king walks in and, and they bow at the king. Jesus is our king. Amen? Amen? Have you ever bowed for your king? Have you ever worshipped your savior? Have you ever lifted your hands to your master? Have you ever just been in his presence and been like, I just, I bow before you. So we talked about being intentional with our faith. And then last week or two weeks ago when I was here, we talked about being intentional with our finances. Being kingdom-minded with our finances. Remember we looked at that scripture talking about having a good eye and a bad eye? Being able to recognize a need and then being generous instead of being stingy? Church? Instead of being stingy? Talked about not being able to serve two gods? We talk about worship and we talk about bowing. In our Wednesday night class, in my class, a couple of guys wonderfully were transparent about, in my opinion, how they bowed to the almighty dollar for a lot of years. Worshipped at great sacrifice, the almighty dollar, for a lot of years. Can't serve two gods. That's what we talked about. Who's your God? As you sit here today, who's your God? Our challenge was to go and, and look at our check register. Check register, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> Confusingly enough, you get two bucks when you get checks. Checks, for those of you that don't know. piece of paper that you write on and give to somebody. Check register is where you're supposed to keep track of those checks. If you're anything like me, when I first got my checkbook, I didn't care about the second book. As long as I had checks, I was good to go. Today we have plastic. So maybe don't check your check register. Maybe go look at your, your bank statement. Where's your money going? Because that's who you serve. It's a challenging thought. So today was going to be part two of the financial F word. Part two. We were going to talk specifically about tithes and offerings, and we were going to pick that apart and, and just have a wonderful conversation about it. And throughout this week, I really think the Lord laid on my heart that, that that's going to get put off, that, that we're going to talk about something else today. And so we'll resume that. This doesn't mean nobody, if, man, if four of you show up for church next week, <laughs> because you know we're going to talk about tithing, I'm coming to your house. <laughs> I'll find you. <laughs> here's the thing here's what was laid on my heart you guys last Sunday night's events in Las Vegas is, it's horrific with a small vocabulary like I have I don't have the words to describe that event I can't imagine it I can't imagine that situation I can't imagine being there and feeling like you have nowhere to run, nowhere to be safe, and then the after effect of it. I can't imagine. I stand here and I'm, I'm looking at Doug. Doug is he, he's a um, EMT. He's a paramedic. Did I insult you? I yeah. You're very kind in saying no. Your wife is going yes, you did. 
I don't know. I don't fully understand the difference, so I apologize. But he works for the emergency services, and as I look at Doug, I'm reminded of the police and the firemen and the paramedics that flooded in to serve people, to save people, to protect people. I can't imagine that event. I can't imagine being there. But I know this. I know it causes questions. It causes us, like I said earlier, it makes us say, God, where are you? Even as believers, Bible-believing believers, we, we find ourselves saying, but God, where are you in this event? Why did you let this happen? God, how could you? How could you? And we find ourselves asking that question, and, and really that's what, what brings me to today's message is, is our hope. Our hope gets mixed up. And what I want to do is just briefly, before we have a time of worship this morning, is I just want to bring us back to this point and remind us, our hope is not in any man aside from Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in President Trump. Our hope was not in President Obama. Our hope wasn't in President Bush when the attack on 9-11 happened. Our hope, it's not in a mighty military, the mightiest military. Our hope is not in millions, billions of dollars. Our hope is in God. Our hope is in the Savior, Jesus the Christ. That's where our hope is in. I hear people comment this week saying, it's just scary. It's, I, I'm just afraid. It makes me afraid. I'm afraid to do this. I'm afraid to do that. I look at Phil. Phil works security at the U.S. Bank Stadium. Can't imagine how many people think twice before going to a 20,000 person concert again. Why? Because I'm afraid. And you guys, I want to encourage you with something today. I want to encourage you to, to not be afraid, be aware. Use your head. My dad used to say that. Use your head. I'm still waiting for that to kick in and for me to use my head sometimes. <laughs> but think. Have common sense. Be smart. But don't be afraid. Amen? Amen? Our hope is not in man. It's not in amen. Our hope is in God. Our hope is the anchor. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 19, the writer makes this statement. He says, this hope, this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain and into God's sanctuary. This hope, this whole section is talking about God's promise and how God cannot break His promises. He cannot do that. And that our hope, the hope that we have in the fulfillment of God's promises is the anchor for our souls. And, and as I look at this event, this thing that happened, if you're a ship and you're out on the ocean, and I've been on cruises, and it's amazing when you walk up to a cruise ship and you're, you're just standing there and it's just like, especially a hick like me, it's like, that's a big boat. You know, I mean, that's what you do. You see it. It's a huge, massive thing, and you're just, it's, it's like, this is crazy. It's bigger than anything I've seen, and, and I'm going to get on this with 4,000 other people. And, but then you get out into the ocean, and you realize, this is a tiny little boat, <laughs> right? It's not as big as it once was, because now it's out there. And when that storm goes, this last cruise, the, the girls and I went on a cruise a year ago, and uh, it was really wavy. It was like you're walking down, and all of a sudden you're like, whoa. I mean, it was wavy, and it blows my mind because we weren't in any storm. It was just windy. But it was able to blow us around as it wanted to with these waves. And some of us, because of the events of last Sunday evening, because of this horrific event, and because of shootings overseas and stabbings and, and all of these things. Some of us are that little boat and we are just getting tossed all over the place. And here's the deal, friends. If our anchor isn't 
firmly set where it needs to be, we're going to find ourselves downstream somewhere a long ways from Jesus Christ. But do you understand that when that anchor is firmly set, when it's hooked in, I was fishing one time up in Ely, and, and the guy I was with, he had this huge metal anchor. And it took us so long to get that anchor up because, because it was a very rocky bottom. And by the time we got this thing up, I mean, we're tugging and tugging and using the motor. I mean, we're wrenching on this thing. We get this anchor up, this heavy, hardcore metal anchor, it's totally mangled, bent up. It's a disaster. And that's the picture that I have with the anchor of our hope. Our anchor should be so firmly set in the rock that is our Savior, in the rock that is our faith and who our God is, that it doesn't matter what storms come, it doesn't matter what evil does, it doesn't matter how bad it gets. Our, our anchor, our hope in God's promise, in our salvation, our hope, our trusting that He doesn't change, Remember that. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our hope, my anchor, is so firmly set. Is, is life going to happen? Are times going to get difficult? Absolutely they are. And do they cause us to sway a little bit? Absolutely. That's the reality of life. But friends, our anchors should be so firmly set that we stay put. That we don't wind up downstream putting our hope and putting our faith in a man who's going to disappoint. In a man who's going to fail. Turn with me in your Bibles to the Psalms real quick. Psalm 18. And you guys, I look at my Bible, and in every Bible I have, this is highlighted. In times of trouble, even as other people come to me having times of trouble, this is a psalm that I will send them to, to refocus. And, and here's something that's interesting about this. You read through the psalms, the psalms that David wrote, and I want you to understand something. In these psalms that David wrote, he talks about God being his mighty fortress. He says this in Psalm 18, starting in verse 1. He makes this proclamation. He says, I love you, Lord. You are my strength. Now keep in mind, this is David, the mighty warrior. This is David who, who took out hundreds and hundreds of men by himself. This is David who has armies at his command. Thousands, tens of thousands. This is David. And what is David saying? He's saying, I love you, God. He's saying, you are my strength. He's not saying, I got this. He's saying, I love you, Lord, and you are my strength. Not this army. Not these 300 mighty men. God, you are my strength. You are my hope. He says, the Lord is my rock. my fortress, and my Savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. Listen to me. Don't get distracted by anything. Listen to me. This is David, a real man, a real warrior, a man that has armies at his command, and he's saying, my hope is in you, Lord. My hope is in you. Flip down to Psalm 146. Psalm 146 says this. He says, praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. The last thing I want coming out of my mouth, he's saying, 
his praises to God. Wrap your mind around that. The last word that I want, the last breath I speak, I want it to be praises to God. He says, don't put your confidence in powerful people. There's no help for you there. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and all their plans die with them. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord their God. What he's saying is don't put your hope in people. Why? Because it doesn't matter your position. It doesn't matter if you're the president of the greatest country on the face of the earth. It doesn't matter. Why? Because when he dies, he's going to go to the same place that I am. My hope is not in him. All of his plans, all of his ways die with him. He's saying, but, but my hope is in the Lord. And joyful are those whose hope is in the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the one true living God. Joyful are those whose hope is in the Lord. And so an event like this happens, and it's so easy for, for us to get distracted. It's so easy for us to look and focus on all of the evil and to say, God, why? And God, where? And God, how? But, but where do we find our peace? Where do we find our confidence? Where do we find our joy? Where do we continue to, to witness? And where do we continue to live? And where do we continue to love? And, and how do we continue to serve? Because our joy and our hope is not found in people. Because people are evil. Our joy, our hope, our confidence, it's found in the one true living God. And friends, in the wake of this event, I want to encourage you. Church, bring your focus back. Bring your focus back on God. Because He never changes. It doesn't matter what happens. And it's not a matter of if something horrible is going to happen again. It's when. Because of the world we live in, because we're sinful, evil people. But our hope isn't in people. Our hope is in the Lord.